Okay, looking at chapter four in our textbook, Digital Radiography and PACS, third edition by Christy Carter and Beth Veal. Here's the objectives I've identified. We wanna talk about the construction of PSP cassette and imaging. Uh, we'll talk about each layer of that, uh, the process of photostimulation and imaging plate, uh, how we read these cassettes, how we erase them. We're also gonna be talking about uh, making sure that we match the body part to the part being examined, which was what we saw last week in the lab, right? That was, and that's a major problem that happens with PSP, and guess what, it can also come back to haunt us with the digital stuff. We'll talk about how technical factors work with these things, grid selection, and I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on grids, but I, I, I want you to know this is a time where we have to think back about grid ratio, um, how we calculate grid ratio, all that stuff, because they can produce a noticeable artifact on these PSP systems. And so I'm not gonna lecture really intensively on the grid part, but I just produced a separate YouTube video and I'll share that link for grid calculation stuff. So, um, and then we'll talk about different manufacturers. So here's the equipment we're talking about, a cassette, and inside that cassette is an imaging plate. Um, you can pull them apart and you can clean that imaging plate. Um, in fact, most of your facilities should be doing that if they have this system, and I'm guessing um, almost all of them are not, uh, but it is helpful to clean these things um, every now and then. That cassette is made out of a lightweight plastic on the front side, and then it's backed by aluminum on the back side to absorb any backscatter X radiation. Um, and then also normally has an anti-static material like felt that protects the PSP plate inside the cassette. So here's examples of what those things look like. That aluminum backing on the back part of the cassette, anti-static material cassette. Now I mean, this, all this may seem really, really boring or whatever, but already we can, we can figure out errors that could come out of humans using the system. Like an example I will give is one time on a portable chest x-ray, I was sleepy, I was tired, I put the cassette backwards, right, behind the patient, hey. and I got nothing, right? It was a really crappy picture. Why? Because I was x-raying through aluminum at that point. Um, so use the cassette in the way that it was designed to be used. Has anyone else made that same error? Okay, a few of us have, right? I'm not, I'm not completely alone. Okay. So if we were to take a little slice of this imaging plate and kind of look at it like a sandwich, we would see these different layers in it. And it is helpful to think about them because there's a rationale for why they're built the way they're built. On the outside, of course, we have a protective layer. That's kind of a no-brainer. If you've got expensive crystals inside of something, you generally want to protect them some way, right? Um, so that protective layer. And then we have that phosphor layer. It's sometimes called the active layer. Um, so I may refer to it as a phosphor layer. I may refer to it as the, as the active layer. Again, it is generally made out of some kind of europium-doped barium fluorohalide. Now, that's a big family of crystals, right? And each, each manufacturer has their own special magical crystal that they make. You can think about them as something like Breaking Bad. They're all making their own crystal, right? Um, then there's going to be a reflective layer right behind that active layer. And so the x-rays are entering through the protective layer, striking the europium-doped barium fluorohalide. And that reflective layer just allows some of the light, if there's any light being produced, to reflect back so that it's not being lost, right? Um, then we have a conductive layer, a support layer, which is the thickest layer of them all, which just keeps the thing from not completely falling apart, right? And then finally, that uh, shielding layer uh, and a backing layer, okay? So the, the significant ones, the ones to really uh, understand is that active layer, um, the, the sometimes one thing I'll, I'll point out, this uh, conductive layer uh, is going to reduce static electricity. And I'm just looking in the textbook on page 44. And some of the newer cassettes also have a color layer, right? And uh, this uh, absorbs the stimulating light but reflects emitted light, right? So it is used for plate reading. So just to break them down, protective layer, thin, tough, plastic protects the phosphor, 
then uh, the phosphor layer, the active layer, it has a photostimulable phosphor that traps electrons during the exposure. So x-rays strike this phosphor layer and it traps those x-rays in the form of an electron. The crystal changes slightly. Um, the most common thing is something in the barium fluorohalide. It may also contain some form of a dye. There's a reflective layer. These are the big kind of ones that are important. It's going to send the light in a forward direction and sometimes it's just black to reduce light spread and it decreases uh, resolution. And then we have a conductive layer that's going to be uh, an absorbent layer and it reduces static electricity. Some of the newer plates have a color layer um, and this is going again to help with the type of light that's being emitted by it when it's stimulated. And then the support layer and backing layer are there just to provide its strength. So there again is that. Um, the only thing I'll add is, is note the barcode label on this illustration. That's going to be used for labeling. Um, so even though you've typed the patient's information into it, at some point the computer has to label that, and so it does it. Some, it can even do it internally if it needs to. So um, they generally have some form of barcode on them somewhere. You, you can, if you look at the Fuji cassette, you can see it's got a little clear window with the barcode in it. Um, sometimes these are scanned by the technologist while they're prior to entering the patient information they might scan the barcode over a laser and then the cassettes tagged to that patient's information. Another is also sometimes a sticker on the cassette somewhere. Um, this was really used frequently in the days of film because you might have like a darkroom technologist that was just developing film because developing film took even longer than reading a CR cassette. And so this was mostly used to communicate information to the darkroom technologist. So since we moved from darkroom technology and film technology into um, computed radiography, we, we had some of these historical artifacts that went along with it. And I view the sticker as that kind of historical artifact. I've never seen anyone use the sticker. But we used to use it like you would indicate on the skeleton where the x-ray was taken. You'd circle the shoulder. You'd circle the right shoulder. And then the darkroom tech would you know, oh, this should be a film of a right shoulder, right? Um, we don't do that anymore. I've never seen anyone do that. A holdover, something to think about. So how does the actual image acquisition work then? It does differ quite a bit from film. Um, but the idea is basically the same. We have a latent image that's going to be formed on this PSP plate. So within the barium floor halide, we've got a remnant beam exiting the patient, striking the active layer of this PSP plate. When an x-ray photon interacts with one of those crystals, it changes the crystal shape, right? Um, it traps that energy in the form of an electron. And that's sometimes called a phosphor center, where that crystal changes its shape and traps the energy in the form of an electron. If you were to imagine, if you had some kind of magical power to see electrons, you could hold up that phosphor plate and you could see a picture, right? But I do not have a magical power to see electrons, so we refer to that as the latent image, right? Latent image. It's there. There's x-ray images on that phosphor plate, we cannot see them, so they are considered latent. So we need to figure out a way to liberate those electrons relatively quickly after exposure because you can imagine it's hard to trap an electron. Just the idea of doing it sounds impossible to me. So over the course of the next few days or hours even, some of that phosphor layer starts to lose its signal, right? the latent image is gradually fading away. You can think about the end of Back to the Future, right? Marty McFly's picture is vanishing, right? That's what's happening here. The, the longer that we wait to develop this thing, the, the less and less information there is in it. So the de deterioration begins almost Im immediately. So what is our friend in this point? It is the reader, right? And we all should be pretty familiar with reader technology. Here's an example of a high volume Fuji reader. Um, there's two basic types, a point scan and a line scan. I don't really care to nitpick about these two different types, right? But we'll talk about them both. 
Um, point scanners are going to have an optical stage where they scan with a laser beam <clears throat> as the cassette is moved under the beam, right? And then it has a pickup guide that goes after the laser beam and it's attached to this big photomultiplier tube. It's picking up the light that's emitted by the phosphor plate, right? And then that's what's digitized. So um, at any point, only a single laser point um, irradiates the image, right? So we see an example of that on page 49 in our textbook, right? So what's happening is the laser's passing over the europium doped barium fluorohalide. It's stimulating it with light. And in response, that crystal emits light, right? So the laser that we typically use is a, um, I think, helium neon laser. It is red in color. And that's important, right? Because red's on one end of the light spectrum. The light that the crystal gives off is bluish purple. That's on the other end of the light spectrum. So we have done that intentionally, right? We've got a red laser because we're trying to pick up a blue light, right? Um, and so that photomultiplier picks up the blue light that's emitted by the crystal, and that is what has turned into a signal. The line scanners um, basically are imaging the plate at one time. They use just kind of a, it, there's an illustration of it on uh, page uh, 48. It's got a single kind of laser line. Uh, and again, I think it's on page 50 as well. So, um, all of this uh, photostimulated luminescence, which is what we refer to the europium dope barium fluorohalide giving off its energy in the form of light, that is called photostimulated luminance because we stimulated it with a laser and it gave off light. That's what photostimulable luminance means, or PSL. Um, uh, let me see what this is saying. I'm not going to worry so much about the charge couple device thing, but. Uh, but just know that that's what's being scanned into the computer. So after exposure, the cassette's removed into the reader. Um, it scans with the laser. There's two scan directions within the reader. There's the fast scan, and that is the scanning direction of the laser. It scans very quickly. Um, and so I just always remember lasers are very quick, and so I'll call that the fast scan direction. And then there's the slow scan direction. This is the sometimes called translation. It's the movement of the PSP plate under the laser. So we'll refer to that as the slow scan, right? Because mechanical stuff moves really slowly. Well, what is a laser then? It stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, right? Um, now, we could really get into the weeds on lasers, and there's a whole other technical degree related to laser technology. We just need to know that the laser that we use is a helium neon laser, right? And so what you have is, again, an anode and a cathode. What are we accelerating from the anode and the cathode? Interestingly enough, we're now accelerating light, and we're using electrons to basically bombard that light in order to make it go that much more quickly, <coughs> right? Um, Helium neon. And the only reason that's important is because it produces a red light. So just always remember the laser, the laser is red. Every annoying kid in eighth grade has what? A, le a red laser, right? So just remember that annoying kid, and that's what we've got inside of the reader an annoying kid in the eighth grade with a red laser, okay? That's all you need to know about laser technology. Um, it needs a constant power source. It shouldn't fluctuate because then we'd have fluctuations in the laser beam. So we'd have fluctuations in stimulation of the PSP plate, which would mean we'd have problems on our picture. Um, and it's going to be passed through an optical mirror because lasers can be bend, bended by optics. So x-rays can be bended as well, but it's much more difficult to bend an x-ray. Um, lasers can be bended very easily just with a laser, I mean with a mirror. And the reason we're doing that is it's allowing us to point and fast scan across the um, 
imaging plate. So I've had an opportunity one time to see the insides of a plate reader while it was reading, and there were two things that were fascinating to me. The first was this beam deflector. It's spinning around really quickly. It's like a crystal, a giant plastic crystal that's spinning around really quickly, and it's deflecting the laser to where it fast scans across the plate. That was really cool. The other thing that was really cool was the photomultiplier tube, so I'll talk more about that here in just a second. But this again is found on, found on page 51 in our, text, in our textbook. So um, we put the cassette into the reader and the plate is pulled out. The PSP plate is pulled out of the plastic cassette, right? Pulled out of the felt lined bag it's inside of. And then that helium laser, that helium neon laser um, scans over the cassette. It's beam width is really freaking small. I don't expect you to know it's a hundred microns, but just know it's really freaking small, right? The zigzag pattern that the laser makes over the um, PSP plate is sometimes referred to as a raster pattern. Um, that just is a fancy computer term that sometimes they ask us about on the registry. Just know that the, the laser has a predictable pattern of travel across the plate, and that predictable pattern is called um, a raster pattern. Why are we shooting this plate with a red laser? Well, it liberates the trapped electrons. So it's taking that latent image on the PSP plate and turning it into an actual digital signal, right? So here again is an example of what that raster pattern might look like. All right. The big things to take away from this are the two terms that are in italics. First off, the laser scans multiple times. This is called translation. And the second thing is that as the laser light um, emits uh, its energy into the crystals and they give off their photostimulation in response, we need to pick that up some way with a photo detector, right? And so sometimes we use what's called a light amplifier. Let me see if there's an example of it in here photo detection tube, it's on page 49. This was the other very interesting part. This is a giant, also something like a plastic crystal that pulls the blue light energy that's being emitted by the crystals up into the analog to digital converter. So it, it's like a big light vacuum and it sucks up that blue light energy. It doesn't care about the red light energy, it just pulls up the blue light energy and that's what we're gonna use to make our picture. And that's sometimes called photo detector or pho photo multiplier tube. Those terms can be used inter pretty much interchangeably. Um, so one final thing to understand about this, uh, this laser is we do really care about the shape of the laser, right? Because the shape of the laser is an actual size, right? It's 100 microns or whatever, so it is not an ideal point of nothing, right? Um, it does have a shape. Um, so we have to shape the laser as it's scanning across the plate, right? Because again, we just want to make sure that we are not getting any variation in our images. I've already talked enough about the beam deflector. Um, I'm just going to move on forward with this. I can probably delete this slide later. Throughput, um, it's much quicker than film, I'll tell you that. Uh, typical throughput, it'd be about a cassette a minute is what you can expect from these readers. Um, but we've all sat in the, in the room here and waited for it to develop a cassette. So, the initial light energy that's given off by the europium dote barium fluorohalide and that's picked up by the photomultiplier could be thought of as an analog signal. It's a continuous signal, right? It has all sorts of variation and noise in it. Um, that needs to be digitized. Each part of it needs to be um, given a numeric value, right? So um, we refer to that as digitization. Digitization refers to taking analog information and giving it a specific numeric value. So during scanning, this light is turned into an electrical signal 
that electrical signal is then sampled and digitized, right? And it's given a specific location inside the image matrix, and it has a specific brightness, right? A specific level of gray. So there has been some controversy. Is a matrix, are the pixels within the matrix best called a square or a point? On the hardware side, we will refer to them as squares, <laughs> and on the software side, they're best referred to as points. Um, each of these pixels range in numbers based on a binary number, right? So 512, I believe, don't quote me on this, is 2 to the 8th power. Um, 1024, I believe, is 2 to the 9th power. Um, but they can be much larger than that. They will always be some power of two because in the world of software, um, everything is expressed in base two. So the more pixels there are, the greater the image resolution for a fixed field of view. And this is nowhere more true than in computed radiography in these PSP systems. They like you to collimate. So each, each pixel contains bits of information. The number of bits per pixel that define the shade of each pixel is known as its bit depth. If a pixel has a bit depth of eight, the number of gray tones that pixel can produce is two to the power of the bit depth. So two to the eighth, 256. Looks like I was wrong about the uh, two to the power of eight, 256. The number of photons detected within the pixel determines the amount of gray level or what amount of bit depth is going to be registered. Yeah? So earlier you said that it had to be a binary number, but 2500 is not a binary. It's not? No. This is a binary to a decimal, but... Then we, I guess we need to get rid of that. I That may be just a typo. Um, Two to the eleven equals twenty forty-eight. He's saying that 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 twenty-five hundred by twenty-five hundred may not be a binary number. Um, just know for the purposes of the registry, it should be a binary number, right? Yeah. So I think he's right. I think that that may not be a binary number. Right, I'm going to go with, with with what Mr. Horner said there. Is it is saying it's binary there? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so this gray level or bit depth will be a factor in determining the quality of the image. And quality is that term that we refer to as it relates to the overall penetrability of the x-ray beam, the overall qu contrast. So anytime I see the word quality, I also think, okay, this is talking about contrast. This is talking about KVP, stuff like that. So again, to review, the reason this is important for us as x-ray techs is not so much the binary part. We do need to understand it's being expressed in binary um, for the most part, except for when, for whatever reason, computer scientists decide to use a number other than binary. Um, for the most part, it's being expressed in a number that's binary. There's two things that this pixel has inside of it. It has a dimension that it's representing, right? Um, and that's tied to spatial resolution, right? And then it has a bit depth that it's able to receive information into, and that represents its contrast re resolution. So spatial resolution is the amount of detail represented or present in the image. It is sometimes used um, we express the modulation transfer function to express this. Sometimes we also look at line pairs per millimeter, those types of things. So a phosphor layer thickness and pixel size determine the resolution of this PSP plate. The thinner the phosphor layer, the higher the resolution. But the problem is if we make a phosphor layer really, really thin, we start to lose, we don't capture as many x-rays. Right? So we get a higher resolution, but we, at the cost of patient dose. So the best 
uh, resolution, spatial resolution for film screen radiography was 10 line pairs per millimeter. So y'all may remember uh, me passing around this line pair per millimeter device here, measurement device. Film has a higher spatial resolution than this PSP technology because PSP resolution is much lower at like maybe two and a half to five line pairs per millimeter. That's the best that we can get out of this, right? So it does not have good as a resolution in terms of that stuff, right? So when it comes to seeing things like bony detail and stuff like that, small trabicular patterns, film would beat digital. Film would beat digital when it comes to seeing little tiny trabicular patterns. But because of all the different shades of gray that a digital system can receive, this bit depth, it has a much higher contrast resolution than film and it also has a much higher exposure latitude. There's a greater number of x-rays, energies at which it can receive a signal and make a picture, right? So we would be much, it's much easier to see fat pad anomalies on a lateral x-ray, on a lateral elbow x-ray using a film system. Right? And if you think about it, the reason's obvious because you've seen people window, change window width and window level on the images. You cannot do that with film. With film, like what you got is what you got. So if you're looking for something with a minute attenuation value, like a fat pad on an elbow, think about how tiny that fat pad is. Right? And there was a fracture and now it's slipped out of the joint space. Um, that would be very difficult to detect on film because you can't window and level, you can't change the contrast values. So this was the big selling point of digital for radiologists. This is why the radiologists bought into it. Because if you, if you tell a, like a, a mean old doctor, right, you're gonna lose spatial resolution going to the digital. Well, hell, I don't want that, you know? But look at this, you're gonna be able to find a fat pad more easily. Okay, I'm sold. So these were big deals back in the days when people fought over this because people did fight over that this and that's one of the reasons why this chapter is so long is it's kind of laying to rest the fight you know this fight from honestly 10 20 years ago now all right the final thing that we need to do is make this system reusable so we are able to erase the cassette we are going to use an intense bright white light to erase the cassette so basically we're just washing it in light and that's the part of the reading system that you can see. So if you're standing by a CR reader, oftentimes you can see that intense white light come out at the end where it's erasing the PSP plate. So um, this uh, erasure mode allows the plate surface to be scanned without recording a generated signal. So we're not gonna get any kind of ghost images or anything like that. And it, what it does is it removes any final trapped electrons that were not um, excited from the bar barium, uh, europium to barium fluoride by the uh, laser. A lot of this stuff is kind of no-brainer, don't overthink it, but once we've read that image, we send it to the computer, that's where it's pre-processed by the computer, and then it goes to the, the monitor to be displayed, and at, during display, this is when we can do any kind of post-processing. So windowing and leveling, zooming in and out, adding annotation, all that stuff is the post-processing which we talked about last week. So um, this, and then ultimately it's sent to PAX. That is the workflow. It is very, very important that we select the appropriate part, right? So if we, if we x-rayed an E, we need to tell it that's what uh, we x-rayed, right? Um, if we do not tell it so say we x-ray a knee but we told it we x-rayed a shoulder it's going to throw off the exposure indicator and may give us a totally garbage image those types of things maybe the information's still there right like we looked at last week the information's still there but it could very easily be obscured so when i'm talking about part selection i'm talking about some kind of drop down menu where you select and you say this is an ap skull So it is not acceptable to select a body part or position different from what was actually performed. If you find yourself performing exams and they're not listed on your workspace, you need to contact the manufacturer, figure out with management, there needs to be a serious conversation about how should we process this image, right? Um, so that everyone knows and we don't have any kind of things that could lead to improper patient exposure. Okay, technical factors that we use.
for this were, are pretty much the exact same as what we could use in radiography with one exception. We're able to, KVP is still selected for penetration, right? And overall quality of the image mass is still selected for the overall darkening or brightness of the image and a part, a, a, an appropriate balance of these is, a, is necessary, right, for patient dose. With the, so these KVP values can range from about 45 to 120, right? Um, anything less than 45, uh, you're going to get some inconsistencies in the image. Anything greater than 120, you're going to start to see inconsistencies. With film, we used to shoot things sometimes at 125 or 130. We never do that now that we're using digital stuff, right? Now, the K-edge of the europium doped barium fluoride halide refers to the point at which we start to see characteristic interactions in that crystal, right? So this would be a point of enhanced interaction for that crystal. It basically is increasing the detective quantum efficiency of that crystal. This happens in energy ranges from about 30 to 50 kiloelectron volts, right? That translates to a KVP of about 60 to 110, right? So in general, the energy ranges for digital, for all the reasons I just listed, I think ideally are 70, because that, that exploits the characteristic edge or the K edge of the anode, the tungsten anode, as well as this phosphor. So 70 KVP to as high as 110. AVP. So those should be the ranges of energies that we're considering according to the science, right? Now you have probably seen KVPs higher than that, um, but for what I'm saying, with both, considering both the K edge of the barium, europium doped barium fluor halide and the tungsten anode, it's ideally about 70 to 110. So as we're selecting kilovoltage peak, we no longer tie this to contrast, right? And this is a significant point. You've probably seen it even in the discussion boards and stuff online. Back in the days of film, we could tie KVP directly to contrast. We don't do that anymore with digital because we can, we've got all this post-processing power that allows us to window level and change brightness and contrast on the images. Um, I just refer to KVP as connected to over by overall penetrability of the X-ray beam. Now it can be, KVP does still tie into subject contrast, the contrast that's inherent in the remnant beam, right? It still connects to subject contrast, but not to actual image contrast. When it comes to selecting mass, mass um, determines the number of photons needed for a particular part, right? And it does this by boiling off electrons at the filament, and then those electrons are used to bombard the anode and produce the x-rays. So, um, one of the best ways I've heard to describe this is KVP is how hard I'm punching you, mass is how many times I'm punching you, right? Um, that's kind of the best way to think about it. Like we looked at last week, anytime there's quantum model, like on this image here, that's a insufficient amount of signal to noise ratio, right? So there's more noise on the image, less signal. This requires an increase in mass. The only way to correct quantum model is to increase the mass. And that's kind of obvious because what happens when we increase KVP? We increase scatter, right? And what we were trying to do was get rid of the noise. So this leads us to one of those kind of really counterintuitive moments where x-ray techs are like, we've got that bariatric patient, we're trying to get an AP chest x-ray, we get the grid out, and what do we do? We drop the KVP down to 90 and we jack the mass way up. Right? What are we trying to do? We're trying to get rid of scatter. So we're decreasing the KVP to reduce scatter while we simultaneously increase the mass to give more signal. Right? So that is that weird bariatric technique where you, you drop the KVP while increasing mass a lot. Right? Um, so when it comes to selecting these image plates, uh, there's really just two things that we would think about is type and size. We don't really think about type all that much because I've not, I've personally never worked with a high spatial resolution PSP cassette. I guess they're out there. All I ever cared about was size. Um, grid selection is important though, right? 
so we're, when we're talking about grid selection, we're talking about frequency, ratio, and whether the, or not the grid is a focus grid. For the most part, we do not use focus grids on these PSP cassettes. I will come back to grids here in a minute. They talk about two different types of cassettes. I'm probably not going to ask questions related to this. I'm not really all that interested in high resolution PSP cassettes because they're shortly going to be completely extinct. Um, but they do have a thinner phosphor layer for all the reasons I mentioned earlier. Um, generally these high resolution cassettes are going to be smaller and this was also true in film imaging. One thing that is important for us to know is when it comes to size, um, using an appropriate size for the cassette is helpful because if we can reduce the amount that we're collimating in. So say I've got like just a hand and I for whatever reason grab the 14 by 17 cassette. That's not a good idea. Why? Because I'm going to have to collimate in a whole lot on that hand, right? And I've just created a whole lot of additional signal outside of the hand that the computer still needs to process. So choose a cassette that fits the part size. Now I mentioned I was going to come back to grids. Grids can produce this kind of artifact here. Do you all remember what I called this artifact? The Moray artifact. Good. And it's tied to a lack of um, signal to sample, right? So we weren't able to sample as quickly as we had the signal. So there's a fluctuation in the image. And that's because we have not exploited the, the Nyquist frequency. We, we, we do not have a sampling rate that's twice the signal rate, right? So what happened was the grid produced an interference pattern in the image. This interfer interference pattern is now making this weird uh, moray pattern on our image. This was not something we saw. This wasn't something we predicted. Grids used to be our friend in the days of film screen. You, you know, unless you were completely grossly misusing the grid, you would not get a grid artifact. You will still see questions on the registry about grid artifacts, right? Because they relate to what these PSP things. The number one grid artifact that we produce now with the grid is a moray pattern, right, on the image. The best way to get rid of that, frankly, is to get rid of the grid, right? So the move now in the technology is to shift towards what we call software grids, right? Is there a way that in, in pre-processing we can clean up the, the noise or clean up the poor contrast and give us, through software processing, a better image? So we're talking more about virtual grids and things like that. If, for whatever reason, you, you still need to use grids, the best grid that you can be use, using would be a fairly low ratio grid. So we're talking about grid frequency, right? Grid frequency is the number of grid lines per centimeter or inch, right? So the higher the frequency, the more <laughs> lines there are, and the finer the grid lines um, in the image, and the less they will in, particularly inter interfere with the image, right? So this typical grid frequency is between 80 and 152 lines per inch. Um, the closer the grid frequency is, right, the closer they are together, um, the greater the likelihood of these moray artifacts, right? So generally the way that I think about it has to do with grid ratio. So if, we're, um, if we calculate out what the grid ratio is, it will give us some whole number generally between 5 and 16, right? So a 5 by 1 grid, right? That is a ratio between the height of these grid, grid strips and the space between them, right? So ideally, for, um, for the purposes of digital imaging or PSP imaging, we want very, very thin grid lines, really, really thick interspace material and we don't want it to be super high. That's what would make for a five by one or a six by one grid, right? But the higher the ratio is, like the 12 by one grid, it cleans up more scatter, right? So that is the bind that we're in. 
we use grids to clean up scatter, but the more scatter we clean up, the more likely we are to produce an artifact. You said thin lines, thick faces, and what? And not that big of a height. Not a big height. That's going to give us that low ratio grid, like a five by one grid. Now, there are different ways to focus a grid. There's parallel and focus grids. For the purposes of our, where the, we're at right now with the state of the art, it is pretty much all parallel grids. Um, again, we are not, because the focus grids, they were fine with film, but now they're producing these artifacts. So a focus grid would basically be set to the amount of beam divergence you had at a given SID, right? So you had to set your SID really carefully with a focus grid because it was matching the beam divergence at, for example, a 40 inch SID. If you set a 50 inch SID, it was going to create a pattern, right? So we've moved away from those completely. Almost everything that I've seen now is parallel grids. These really don't care. Um, uh, ideally, they shouldn't be used less than a 48, 48 inch SID. So if you do need to use a grid portably, um, go ahead and go out to like a 50 inch SID. Okay, like we've mentioned collimation, right? Anytime we collimate, we're reducing the amount of scatter that's being produced. Um, grid, of course, will absorb that scatter. Um, but for the most part, we still want to collimate appropriately, even if we're using a grid. Shuttering, like we talked about last week, is a post-processing thing that's done by the computer. Um, and it does not replace proper collimation. So, uh, so there's two forms of post-processing that can add these black um, masks to the image, right? One has to do with edge detection, right? Um, and that is generally referred to as a black mask or something like that. Shuttering matches closer to cropping. So if a technologist crops an image to the area that they should have collimated to, that is beyond our scope of practice. Okay. We should continue to use conventional lead markers for this because marking the, place, the patients um, in post-processing creates all sorts of legal issues. So, uh, to go back to this issue of collimation, right, and choosing the correct cassette size, the first thing that the computer is doing as it's digitizing the image and processing it is it's identifying what is the exposure field borders. This is particularly important on the PSP systems. It's not as necessary with the flat panel stuff. It doesn't like if things are offset. Like, I was looking at some images from... Uh, DeSoto just the other day, and I think they were done on a, on a digital system. I think it was a Wi-Fi digital system. But they'd done a lower extremity, like a tib-fib. They'd angled the patient's leg across, kind of uh, diagonal along the image, and it was not able to identify the field borders, right? Now, my understanding it was just PSP systems that had that problem, but then I found, okay, digital's still doing this. The flat panel systems are still doing this. So the reason for that is it cannot find the area of the image. Now, be aware that some of these different manufacturers use terminology that sound really similar to our terminology to describe this. Like AGFA uses the term collimation to talk about exposure field area recognition, right? That's just kind of confusing to me, but it's there. It's out there in the literature. So each vendor has a specific tool that's going to be used for identifying that exposure field. And it's going to differ, again, based on the part, because um, it's identifying what an S minimum and an S maximum, and it's using that information to help it find the exposure field border. Now, you can imagine all sorts of artifacts that can result from this process, right? So we need to think about four different areas where the artifacts might result. From the image plate itself, right? From the plate reader, from an image processing and then from the printer. Back in the days when we were still printing images, which happened to coincide, because what happened was we rolled out digital, we all bought Fuji systems, 
the radiologist still wanted to read film. So what do we do? We digitized the patient's information and then we literally printed it to film. Right? Have you, any of y'all ever printed a film of an x-ray? A few of us have. So there's so still some sites that are doing this. Sometimes if you're working at a rural facility, they'll do it because they're, they aren't able to burn a cassette or they want to send something with the patient for life flight or there's a surgeon that still likes to see the film, right? Those are some of the common reasons for why we still print to film. But again, we're just introducing another potential node for error when we do printing. So artifacts, the first thing is gonna be the plate itself. We can have cracks and scratches on the plates and you probably can think of sites where you've seen cracks and scratches on the plates. Here's what they might look like. So here's some dents or scratches on the PSP plate. They're really, really small. Um, if we're looking at this elbow, you can see it. I guess it's just, what would that be? Lateral to the part, we see a little tiny scratch. That's not a bone fragment, right? That is a scratch on the PSP plate. It could be mistaken for a bone fragment, right? So oftentimes that plate needs to be sent back to the manufacturer for replacement. Um, sometimes, have you ever had a site where the lead marker got eaten by the CR reader, right, or something like that? Any kind of adhesive that's getting stuck inside the CR reader gets hot, it can lead to all sorts of weird artifacts on the cassette. It can leave a residue. So we see on this uh, chest x-ray, there's some kind of gunky residue there. It looks like it's overlapping the patient's uh, left scapula just below the acromion process that is not there in the, that's not a staple it's nothing in the patient's anatomy it's someone's marker tape inside the reader when we oftentimes out west we would see this i have not seen this so much in the south because generally our air is much more humid than it is out west out west where it's dry especially if it's cold, static electricity becomes a real hazard. Like there's actual static mats and stuff when you're pumping your gas and things like that because you can blow up a gas station with static electricity. And I remember in particular, it never ceased to terrify me waking up in the middle of the night and like walking to, you know, touch a doorknob, you'd get knocked halfway across the room, right? So uh, static can build up also in these cassette plates. They have things inside them that are meant to reduce the amount of static inside of them. But if there's a static discharge as the plate is being slipped from the felt, that can re result in an artifact as well. Um, other things that can result from these, there's backscatter, so like dark line artifacts. Um, uh, and for the most part, we want to use proper collimation and keep our cassettes clean. It reduces almost all of these areas of problem. Here's just some more examples of plate damage, black lines, weird uh, pixel configurations, things like that. All right, now moving inside the plate reader itself, the reader can produce artifacts largely related to the direction of scan, right? So that's why I spent so much time talking about scan directions. There's the fast scan direction, the slow scan direction, because why it produces artifacts. So here's an example of that type of plate reader artifact. This is found on page uh, 59 in the textbook. So uh, this is noise from the reader electronics themselves. So as the cassette's being scanned through it, there's some kind of mechanical vibration inside the reader. And that mechanical vibration, it's like a whoop, whoop, whoop. You can think about it like your, um, your washing machine when it starts to shake. That's what's happening inside this reader, and it's producing this kind of error. Um, generally, if we see horizontal white lines, these are caused by dirt somewhere on the light guide, and they need to come clean the light guide. Um, if we see uh, multiple images in a single cassette, um, Sometimes there's a cassette that's been exposed multiple times, right? So this might actually have been a workflow error where we accidentally took both the AP and the lateral forearm on a single cassette, right? This would be similar to a double exposure in film screen.
Sometimes these things do not erase sufficiently, right? So it leaves a little bit of a ghost image on it. We probably need to make sure that the lamp is still working appropriately. And then um, if we have the orientation of a stationary grid um, that's off in relation to the, uh, uh, the laser scan, we want to make sure that the orientation of a stationary grid uh, needs to be perpendicular to the direction of laser scan, right? Um, perpendicular, so the, the laser scanning, if the fast scan direction is this way, widthwise across the cassette, which it almost always is, we want the grid lines to run lengthwise, right? This will reduce the error, right? Um, if we have oscillating grids like Bucky's, they do not cause the Moria artifact because they've blurred the grid lines out. So here's an example of perpendicular versus parallel. Um, it's very, very faint. It's better demonstrated, I think, in our textbook on page 59. Um, All right, finally, printer artifacts. Sometimes we can get fine white lines or areas of increased darkening on the image because of debris inside of the laser printer. So we just need to clean that printer out. So operator errors related to this is if we change the collimation, it will change the exposure indicator, right? So just be aware of that. Um, as you cone more appropriately, you will get a difference, same technique, different amount of coning, you'll get a difference in your S number. Um, if we've dropped or damaged the cassette, the hinge on it that pops open to release the plate may be damaged as well, and then we get these crazy kind of artifacts like this, where the cassette itself is damaged and the mechanism of release is now uh, showing up on our picture. And then finally, of course, not using appropriate mass, right? We've talked about this quite a bit. So we want to find an appropriate balance of image quality to patient dose. So here's some examples, and we looked at this a little bit more closely last week. All right, that is it for this lecture. Thank you all so much for your attentiveness. That's about how I feel at the end of this.